Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the fourth in our series of six online events, as I'm sure you will all be aware, marking in very different ways the centenary of the founding of the BBC in 1922. Well, just hold on, if you can bear with us a few more minutes, because I think a large number of people have signed up for this event. If you could just all ensure that you're muted, I'm sure you all know the ropes by now, I hardly need to, uh, to say it, but just, just please do make sure that you are. All right, well, it's two minutes past eight, so I think we will make a start. Um, as the founding director of the Insiders Outsiders Project, which pays tribute to the huge, diverse and pervasive and indeed long lasting contribution of those who fled here from Nazi Germany to this country's culture, it's my very, very great pleasure to welcome you to this evening's event. I should say that as well as Insiders Outsiders involvement, this is very much a joint endeavor with Jewish Renaissance Magazine and also the Lion. Lions Learning Project, and we'll be hearing from Sybil Sheridan of that project um, at the very end. Um, now, I think many of you will have indeed been following the whole series, or at least some of them. Last week, we had a fascinating event looking more at the drama and theatre side of things within the BBC. And then we had the pleasure of actually of hearing from three direct descendants, the children of Martin Eslin, Jack Rosenthal and Jonathan Miller. And uh, tonight's going to be very different. None of the three speakers are related by blood to the main protagonists we're going to be focusing on, but they do have the impeccable credentials of having each of them written books on the subject about which they're going to talk. So uh, without further ado, I will just sort of tell you a little bit about the plan of action for tonight. We're going to start with Dr. Stephen Games talking about Nicholas Pevsner, the elder statesman, one might say, certainly in terms of his birth date of the three figures. Uh, we'll then move on to Alison Garnham talking about Hans Keller and the music field, as I'm sure most of you are already aware. And then we'll finish off with Dr. Ines Schlenker talking about a third figure, somebody who, who's relationship with the BBC wasn't as central to her life or indeed to the BBC as that of the other two, but for known for her work, her wonderful illustrations for the Radio Times. Uh, in other words, Milan Cosman, who was, as many of you may well be aware, the wife of Hans Keller, but very much an individual in her own right. So I would like to start by introducing uh, Stephen Games, if I may, just fairly briefly for reasons of time. Um, he's a designer, an editor, and an award-winning architectural historian, formerly working with the, uh, the Guardian, the BBC, please note, and The Independent. He's currently the owner and publisher of Book Launch magazine and the Envelope Books Publishing House. Among his numerous other writings, he's published not one, but four books on Nicholas Pevsner, thereby, in his own words, changing public perceptions of Pevsner's origins, values and reputation. And before I hand over to Stephen, I'll just mention two of the most pertinent ones. Uh, one, first one published in 2010, uh, Pevsner, The Early Life, Germany and Art, and most directly relevant, Pevsner, The BBC Years, Listening, please note, Listening to the Visual Arts, published in 19, uh, sorry, in 2015. So over to you, Stephen. Well, uh, thanks very much for the introduction. Nikolaus Pevsner, uh, he was born in 1902, and he died in 1983, and he was a German art historian. And uh, in terms of uh, 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 this talk, uh, we value him because he was, uh, until Neil, Neil McGregor came along, probably the art historian who'd done more work on uh, BBC, on BBC Radio than, than anybody else. Between 1945 and 1977, he gave 114 talks about some aspect of art history, uh, architectural history on the BBC, and almost entirely on the third programme and, and, um, and then on Radio 3. He himself would have regarded himself as, uh, as an art historian, I think, rather than an architectural historian. That is to say that in the terms in which he was brought up as a, a student in Germany, architectural history would have been regarded as a subcategory of art history. 
And he comes out of an extraordinary uh, academic culture, quite unlike anything that we had, or even now have uh, in, in the UK. Uh, the ground that he <clears throat> covered in the talks that he gave for the BBC uh, ranged from um, Gothic architecture, early Gothic architecture, all the way through to modern architecture. And the postures, the positions that he took on those subjects ranged from um, uh, uh, sort of uh, introduction, introduction of the basic history for an audience that was clearly not expected to have any recognition of it, through to campaigning and propaganda on topics that he felt very strongly about. And something we need to uh, come back to a little bit. Um, he, his heyday, I suppose, was 1955, because he was the first art historian to give the wreath lectures. He gave the wreath lectures of 1955. Uh, and he had, uh, he adopted as a topic the that of the Englishness of English art. He wanted to explain to the English, and I don't think he distinguished between the English and the British. I don't think he really knew what the Scots or the Welsh or the Northern Irish were. He, uh, for him, the English were, were the British, and he wanted to explain what was English about English art. And that <clears throat> becomes a rather contentious topic as well, which again, we should, we should uh, look at in a moment. Uh, he had so much that he wanted to say that his wreath lectures went on than anyone else's had before. I think the wreath lecture started in 1948, so he must have been the, what, the seventh or eighth uh, wreath lecture um, uh, then. Um, he had, he was invited uh, to take on the wreath lectures because he had developed such an extraordinary charismatic presence uh, on the radio up until, up until then. He starts off in 1945, um, in 1945 and 1946, doing some very workaday journalistic sort of reviews of an exhibition at the Royal Institute of British Architects, for example. Not very interesting, not very dynamic, but also not very long. So he's not really getting into his stride there. Uh, but he's doing something that no one else is really interested in doing. Uh, there is certainly a prejudice against uh, um, architectural commentary on the radio. Uh, I, there are exchanges of letters that you can read in the BBC archive in Cavisham, where uh, producers say, oh, we did something about architecture about a year ago. Do we really need to do it again? Um, so there's a prejudice against. He breaks through that, I think, eventually, because he's recognized by producers uh, in the talks <clears throat> department um, as something, as having something very interesting uh, uh, and uh, valuable to say. The oddity about him, of course, is that he's a German, and he's a German with an extraordinary command of English. Um, and I still haven't been able to tell whether uh, his, his route into art and architecture is something German or something personal. And you can tell by some of the questions I've already raised that the question of nationality, nationalism, is something which is very important here, both in the analysis of him and the analysis of the things that interested him. Rather, I'm thinking now of sort of angry young men and John Osborne and things like that in 19, exactly at the same time as the, uh, as the Wreath Lectures. Um, there is the idea of clever people saying things in a new modern way, uh, 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 not the formal way that their, that their elderly uh, 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 masters uh, might have done uh, um, a, few, a few years earlier. Pevsner is able to introdu introduce the subject of art uh, to a lay audience in a way that that audience really uh, enjoys. Uh, he uses strange uh, expressions he uses. There is an informality, let's say, uh, in, in some of the things he says that, it, that is quite new. Um, it's something that we recognize also in his books from 1948. In 1948, he was commissioned by Penguin Books, by Alan Blaine, uh, to do an investigative series of books about English art and this uh, English architect. And this became The Buildings of England, a 46 volume series, uh, uh, looking county by county at all, every building that he thought was important in England. And the books are marked by his wonderful little curiosities of speech. <clears throat> uh, he talks about a prison. He says, 
uh, his comment on the prison is built by convicts, and there's little more to say, uh, of another building, he says, so intensely medieval as to be in, immediately recognizable as Victorian. Um, he was wonderfully pithy in the things that he said. And that pithiness worked, I think, very well uh, on, on the radio. Um, the, the, the background uh, to, I mean, how was it that he became an art historian and why did he become an art historian here? Well, his, he was Jewish, he, uh, that is to say his parents were Jewish. He was born in 1902. His father and his mother were both Russians and they established uh, a home in Leipzig. And he was sent to the Tomana Schule, the St. Thomas uh, uh, School, very, very uh, superior school connected with the church where uh, uh, Johann Sebastian Bach had been the Kapellmeister. And the boys who went there, <clears throat> excuse me, the boys who went there were sent from all over Germany and really had a sense of themselves as superior beings. And very quickly, I think, Pevsner realized that being Jewish wasn't the greatest thing. We're talking about the 1910s here. And I think was uh, a snob uh, about the culture that he came from. His father still spoke in very, very Russian, very Russian accent. And it was important to Pevsner uh, that to escape bullying, um, he quickly became, becomes German. And by the time he goes to university, he goes straight to Leipzig. He, like many students, he attends four uh, universities in Germany. Um, he has fallen in love very, very early at the age of 16 with the daughter of an important lawyer who also lives in uh, Leipzig, uh, uh, an appeal lawyer, um, whose mother is Jewish, but the lawyer himself isn't. And she inducts him into Lutheranism, the dominant church of, of, of North Germany. And he very quickly and very gratefully um, gives up Judaism to become a Lutheran. So there was a strong sense of his wish to be German, his wish to be seen as German. Once he's at <clears throat> university studying uh, art history, um, he's, uh, the, the, his attraction to Leipzig is that the head of the department there is a man called Wilhelm Pinder. And Pinder was recognized by, his, by Pevsner's mother, who's a very bright woman, and um, translates texts from academic texts from French into German. She says, he's a very bright chap, this young Wilhelm Pinder. I think you'll like him. And he did indeed. There is a problem with Pinder. The problem with Pinder is that Pinder had an excessive sense of German nationalism, which was one of the things that marks German art history art, um, in the, well, certainly in the late uh, 19th century and into the 20th century. And to a state that art, art historians uh, have been recognized by our generation or so of historians as contributing to the Nazi project. And they do so because of an obsession that they have, which is what is it to be German? What is it to, how does a, 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 a race, how does a nation represent itself in its art? And what can one then say back from the art that it produces about the character of that race? It's a it's a, a, a sort of, what's that, not a vicious circle, but I mean, it's, there's a circular logic there. You can generalize about a race's art by looking at the people, but you can generalize about the people by looking at its art. And it, that circularity was never a problem uh, for the uh, art historians uh, who, who promoted it. And uh, I, I jump onto this very quickly because there are all sorts of things that I could say about Pevsen, but I think in the context, and given that this is probably a Jewish audience, I don't know, I think it's important to, to bring out this particular problem. When Pevsner comes to this country in 1933, and he gets out of Germany very, very quickly, uh, he loses his job in the summer of 33, he casts around quickly uh, for somewhere to go. Um, his first choice, is to go to a newly set up academy in Italy, where he imagines that he will be able to teach the history of German art to Italian art historians. And he particularly likes this academy um, because it is itself quite a right-wing organization. He isn't accepted, guess why? Uh, eventually he comes to London in November of 33 and he sets up here. One of the difficulties though, 
is that the, um, the body that helps to resettle foreign academics doesn't have any places for art historians to go. There are lots of places if you're a, phys a nuclear, if you're a physicist or a scientist or a mathematician and so on. Um, but if, you're in, if your subject is art history, we just didn't do art history in the 1930s. And this becomes one of Pevson's projects. How do we promote the study of art history in this country? Because it's very, very important. It was started in Edinburgh. The Courtauld Institute uh, had, uh, recent, uh, had recently been set up. Otherwise, if you were um, an architect, you might learn about a, a bit of art history or architectural history uh, when studying architecture, which you would probably have done at a technical, technical college or at art school at, in evening classes, because that whole side of teaching was extremely primitive too. Um, he comes and he uh, um, works for Gordon Russell, the furniture manufacturer, as an advisor on modern design for a while. And he quickly starts writing articles for the Architectural Review, an intellectual uh, 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 magazine of, of the period, and is very highly regarded so that by the time the war breaks out and the existing editor of the Architectural Review uh, is sent for war, war service, uh, Pevsner is adopted as acting editor after he's done a certain number of months in an internship camp at Highton. Um, he's, he managed to get out quickly because friends pull strings. Um, he gets out and he becomes acting editor of the Architectural Review. And his progress from then is very rapid. He has already brought out a book in, 18, uh, in 1935, um, looking into uh, industrial art, uh, an inquiry into industrial art, which is really a critique of the poor quality of industrial art in, 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 England, in England, compared with the very high quality of contemporary industrial art in, 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 in Germany. Um, he then writes a book, which is really about how the, how, the arts and crafts movement inspired Walter Gropius. And then in 1941, he writes a history of European architecture called Outline, an outline of European Architecture, um, published by Penguin as, the, as his pioneer's book um, uh, would be um, when it's republished. And then in uh, a, a year or so later, he's asked by Alan Lane to become editor of um, uh, King Penguins. And he takes over King Penguins from about volume seven, I think six or seven, through to maybe he does something like a 50 or so volumes. So he's doing a fantastic amount of work. Um, and then in 1944, Birkbeck College asks him to become uh, a, a lecturer in, in architectural history, and he takes that on. So he's working for the Architectural Review. Uh, he's writing other articles. He's working for Penguin Books. He's writing for Birkbeck. Terribly, terribly busy. The oddity is you would have thought that with his background, he would be just the sort of person to have been picked up by the BBC and uh, get involved in black propaganda in the war effort. And he certainly did try to get involved with the BBC at the start of the war. And for some reason he was turned down. Now, whether he was turned down because it was understood that unlike one would have assumed most Germans coming to this country, you know, if you're, if you're, um, uh, if your career has been terminated by Nazis, then presumably your political <laughs> affiliations would be anti-Nazi and left-wing. Um, Pevsons never were, but he had to keep this very well wrapped up. And the extent to which he was, had been a sort of German nationalist, terribly impressed with Wilhelm Pinder, his Liebermeister, his, his, his doctor Vater, um, who, who supervised his doctoral thesis. Wilhelm Pinder, this is, who ransacked uh, um, Eastern uh, Europe looking for art that the Reich could bring back to Berlin or to, um, or, or to the, the, the Hitler Museum that was planned. Um, this was all embarrassing stuff. Was it that that kept him out of the BBC during the war? I have no idea. So it wasn't until just his first talk is February 45, which is effectively the end of the war. He doesn't really get asked to do talks and, until the war is over. And then he's given effectively free reign. He's kept under control to some extent by a very, very remarkable um, BBC producer, um, um, uh, Basil Taylor, um, who does uh, eight or nine talks with him uh, up to 1950. And then there is clearly a falling out because Taylor is a proper 
English intellect um, who doesn't wish to uh, who doesn't wish to allow Pevsner the freedom that, uh, that that Pevsner wishes. Pevsner is tendentious. Pevsner wants art to prove things about society. And on the third program, that's not the agenda. The agenda is to take a topic and to explore it. And, um, and, and, and Pevsner finds it terribly, terribly difficult to do this. He believes, for example, that art should not be too emotional. Uh, that art cannot stand emotion and should be restrained. Um, and uh, he, he, he believes that uh, 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 the, the idea that, that, that art should be expressive of the, of the character of, of, of the, the nation that created it. Um, he is given a little bit more leeway by Anna Kalin, the next producer he deals with, known as Newter, who came from Kaliningrad. Um, and then Donald Boyd, who had been a uh, journalist at The Guardian, he's actually the person who writes The Guardian Style Guide, is given Pevsner um, to do the Reef Lectures. And there is a kind of collapse. Pevsner uh, enters the project of trying to define for the English what Englishness is, and ends up talking contradictory nonsense. He wants to explain, for example, that, um, um, for example, if you compare French cathedrals with English cathedrals, go to Beauvais, it's all about height. There's nothing but height. The columns, the columns go all the way up and there's nothing to interrupt their, their, their flow. But if you go to an English cathedral, it's a little bit squatter, there are horizontal lines that go through the verticals that break it up. It's solid, it's sensible, it's logical, it's rational. It doesn't have the explosion of emotion which somewhere like uh, um, Beauvais has. Um, he, wants to, he wants to say things like that. But on the other hand, how does he deal with a very tall Englishman? <laughs> I mean, he, you see, because what he wants to say is, well, the English are kind of squat as well. The English are kind of practical and sensible and rational. You know, they're like um, lovable cockneys. You know, their architectures like them. And then he has to explain why there are very tall people, or why there are people with wonderful senses of humor, or no sense of humor at all. And it all becomes a little bit difficult. And the, the upshot of this is that the wreath lectures, although they become this, this, this first marker for the fact that you can put an art historian in front of the microphone and he can talk for ages and ages and ages. Um, critically, they go down very badly. And Pevsner's self, his reputation, his, his sense of himself, I mean, sort of collapses afterwards as well. And although he goes on talking on the radio for another, where are we, for, uh, 55, uh, another 20 years or so, I think, uh, he finds it very, very hard to recover. He has brought too much baggage over with him from Germany, and he doesn't know how to discard it, and no one can really help him, and he's terribly eminent. And there is an entirely different cohort of architectural historians that comes along, or several different cohorts, that really take the lead and leave him sort of abandoned. There are, for example, um, there was a very important library in Hamburg, the, the Warburg Library, uh, 80,000 books. Uh, they managed to get them out in um, uh, 1936. They're now part of the University of, of London. There is a group of academics terribly interested in the survival of antiquity, how the classical world relates to the Renaissance world relates to today. Very intellectual, um, but without any of the sort of nationalistic um, preoccupations that, that Pevsner had. On the other hand, there are uh, there there grows up a, a new set of younger historians who don't like Pevsner's um, selling of more German modernism, the Bauhaus Gropius, as the only way of doing modern architecture, and particularly in America, in the 1970s, there grow up there grows up a, a group of people who say we're not going to be told by you know, daddy, as it were, by uncle, how to do modern architect. There must be many more choices. And out of that violent reaction, which very much takes him uh, as, as the thing that they're kicking against, 
there grows up what then becomes postmodern, the postmodern movement in architecture. And poor old Bevson, I'm afraid, is, is left abandoned. We have to thank the BBC, though, for really promoting him as a popular, as a popularist, uh, the man who's able to talk to uh, the, the British public and explain things that simply weren't on the uh, academic agenda and the popular agenda until he came along. And I probably talked for much too long and I'm going to stop now. <laughs> Thank you very much, Stephen. Excellent. Um, it's tempting to open this up to questions now, but I think probably we should let mm -hmm. each of the three speakers have their say and then start talking between us and hopefully taking questions from the audience as well uh, towards the end. So I think with Without further ado, if I may, I will introduce another doctor, Dr. Alison Garnham this time, uh, who describes herself as follows, a cultural historian specializing in the social history of music in Britain in the mid 20th century. In the 1990s, she was the founding archivist, the initial archivist of the Hans Keller archive at Cambridge University Library. And again, her credentials are sterling when it comes to the subject she's going to be talking about. Her books include the following, Hans Keller and the BBC. That's obviously the most relevant. And with a lovely subtitle, I do love it, Alison, The Musical Conscience of British Broadcasting, <laughs> 2003. Uh, subsequently, Hans Keller and Internment, something maybe if there's time we can touch on, 2011. And for the centenary of his birth, the biography called A Musician in Dialogue with His Times, 2009. 19. Um, she is also, as a kind of corollary of this, very interested in the history of music broadcasting with a particular interest, and this I think will intersect nicely with what um, Stephen has been touching on, the uh, interest in the competing ideologies of nationalism versus internationalism in the post-war BBC. And last but not least, she's currently a researcher at the Royal College of Music, working on the wonderful uh, project some of you may know about called Music, Migration and Mobility. Over to you, Alison. Thank you very much, Monica. Uh, well, I'll start with one of the points that David Hendy makes in his new centenary history of the BBC, um, which he said again in the talk that he gave at the beginning of this series. Um, and that's the importance to the BBC, to the formation of its character as an institution, of the fact that it came out of war. He's not talking primarily about the technology of radio, although, of course, war does accelerate technological development, but the psychological effect on the generation who founded the BBC of the shattering experience that they've just been through. The desire to build a better world, the sense that civilization is a fragile thing, and the importance of using this new technology for the public good. These were built into the DNA of the BBC from the start. Then, of course, less than 20 years later, they were all engulfed in war again. So this public service mission was renewed for the next generation. Um, but it was now on quite another scale. Coming out of the Second World War, the BBC was no longer a tiny startup, but a huge national institution. Now with the resources and responsibilities of multiple radio networks, overseas broadcasting on a vast scale and the new medium of television. Planning for peace started long before the end of the war and was hugely ambitious. One internal BBC document uh, that I've seen from 1941 talks of radio as the prime re-educative agency of the post-war world. The arts were crucial to this mission, particularly in the mind of William Haley, who was the BBC's director general at the end of the war and who founded uh, its new third programme with the aim of, in his own words, making available to everyone the best that has been thought or said or composed in all the world. As he said in a speech at the end of 1944, victory in war is only the beginning. It is what we manage to build following the exertions of these six long years that really matters. And of nothing is that more true than of broadcasting. I started with this idealistic vision of the purpose of broadcasting because this was central to Hans Keller's relationship with the BBC. And his 20 years on the staff were divided down the middle by a passionate battle over what he and indeed many others saw as the beginning of the BBC's abdication of its cultural responsibilities. In 1969, Keller led a rebellion of hundreds of production staff against the management plans for a radical restructuring of radio, which included the abolition of the third programme. This mattered so much to Keller because of the enormous importance of radio to music. As he put it, 
radio is vital to the survival of music as a living art. Now that might sound a bit over the top until we remember just how powerful the BBC was at that date and how much musical experience had been changed by it. It held its monopoly in radio broadcasting for 50 years and was now thoroughly embedded in every part of the musical life of the country. By far the biggest employer of musicians and patron of music there has ever been. Also important to Keller was the nature of radio as a medium. He was deeply concerned by what technology was doing to music, by the way that recorded sound was pushing people away from live music making, by the effect on listeners of the constant use of music as a background, including the wash of poor quality film music, um, and the effect on performers of the gramophone's emphasis on technical perfection, the artificial splicing together of different takes, which disrupted the musical communication, and the fear of error inhibiting risk-taking. Radio, or at least live radio, could still preserve the unique nature of musical performance as a one-off fleeting utterance with improvisation at its core, as opposed to the constructed, fixed and repeatable gramophone record. Radio, though it separates music from place and thus enormously uh, magnifies the potential impact of a single performance, can still keep hold of music's essential relationship to time. Hans Keller first broadcast on the BBC in 1956 and he joined its permanent staff three years later. He was already well known in musical London by then as a writer, editor and teacher. He stood out in part because of his impressive knowledge of musicianship and his distinctive combination of music and psychology, but also, it must be said, because of his enthusiastic embrace of controversy and frequent criticism of his fellow music critics. I made myself an outsider, he once said in a radio interview. I only joined the critics in order to fight them explaining that he was attacking his colleagues in order to defend composers and performers that he thought uh, unjustly criticised, and to question the foundations and assumptions of music criticism itself. Early on, he was taken aside by the editor of one of the publications he wrote for and told, it's the tradition here that critics don't criticise each other. But it seemed ridiculous to Keller that those who regularly tore apart performers and composers in public, sometimes on the basis of ignorance and misunderstanding, should be immune to criticism themselves. This was to be a recurring pattern. Keller deliberately avoided becoming a comfortable insider anywhere, and he turned an intensely critical eye on anything with which he was involved, and that included the BBC. And incidentally, just thinking about what Stephen said about how Pevsner responded to anti-Semitic bullying at school, I can tell you that Keller's response was the exact opposite. He, that prompted him to learn Yiddish, start, he started going to synagogue, he adopted a Jewish accent and generally was intent on showing his Jewishness as much as he, as, as he possibly could. Keller's broadcasting career got off to a typically original start when in 1956 he proposed to the BBC a programme of musical analysis without any words. In a way, this was also part of his battle against his fellow writers on music with their purple prose and tautological descriptions of things you can hear anyway. What is the point of attempting to describe a piece of music in words? Much more interesting is to try and understand it in its own terms, why this piece makes sense as a unity, what holds it all together. He called his programme The Unity of Contrasting Themes, and it took the form of a recomposition of a familiar classical masterpiece design, designed to demonstrate how all the diversity grows from a single basic idea, with Keller turning one theme into another before your very ears, as it were. He wanted to show that music is a mode of thought quite separate from words and concepts, and what it communicates is inexpressible by any other means. Um, and also that it can only really be understood in its own terms. The complete wordlessness of his programme was designed, said Keller, to be a modest monument to the independence of musical thought. Listeners were intrigued, and the BBC commissioned several of these programmes, as did the German radio station Norddeutsche Rundfunk. Uh, 
And there was much positive reaction from musicians. Benjamin Britten, for example, on hearing Keller's analysis of his own second quartet, immediately commissioned him to write a new score for the Albra Festival. And William Glock published the score of Keller's first analysis and then commissioned a new one for performance at his Dartington Summer School, where he now invited Keller to come and teach. Keller's first visit to Dartington turned out to be highly successful, and the summer school became an annual feature of his calendar from then on. To give you a sense of the effect that he had on young musicians, let me just read this extract from a letter from the pianist Susan Bradshaw to William Glock, describing her first impressions of him that year. I first met Hans at Dartington Summer School in 1958 and was predictably bowled over by the sheer exuberance of the man, by his boundless enthusiasm for every one of his consuming passions and his interest in anybody and everybody who shared them. People came alive in his presence. He took every encounter, every question, as if it were the most important issue of the moment. And he would talk all day, even to the early hours of the next morning, in order to resolve it. He was the only person I ever met to whom everything, particularly, of course, musical things, really mattered. The year after that, William Glock was appointed controller of music at the BBC. It was a stunning surprise. The record producer Walter Legg said at the time, I feel rather as though I were a citizen of Wittenberg in 1536 and Luther had just been elected Pope. The appointment a few months later of Hans Keller to join the staff of Music Division was also controversial. Over my dead body, the BBC's then head of music programmes was said to have declared in view of the trenchant criticism of the BBC's music policy that Keller had published over the years. Glock came in with a strong agenda for change and significantly powerful support from the BBC's senior management, who were aware that BBC Music Division had never really recovered from the war, partly because of constant disruption in its leadership. Between 1945 and 1952, the BBC got through five directors of music, two of whom died in office, so it's not surprising that its music policy should have become rather staid. Glock knew that he would have to recruit new staff in order to make things happen, and Keller was the first to join, and he in turn helped recruit many of the others. Keller's first post was Music Talks producer, and he wasted no time in bringing new voices onto the air, particularly young composers and performers, rather than their critics. After six months, Glock moved him to be in charge of chamber music, where he worked to transform the standard of performance and also the presentation of chamber music so that instead of isolated works, listeners could become newly aware of a whole tradition rooted in Haydn and extending to the present day. Despite Keller's success in that role, Glock soon had him on the move again, this time to take charge of the orchestral and choral producers, uh, leading to much livelier and more substantial programmes. And then a couple of years later, Keller also took on the planning of the European Broadcasting Union's new concert seasons, adding an exciting new international dimension to his work. Glock saw Keller as undoubtedly one of the finest musicians living in the country, and his presence at the BBC created a constant ferment of ideas and criticisms of the greatest value to anyone genuinely concerned with doing his best for music and the BBC. Keller thoroughly enjoyed himself at the BBC in the 1960s. He and Glock certainly had their differences, but it was a very creative collaboration. More widely, the whole BBC at that time felt like a place where individual thinkers or minds of sincerity and vision to use the words of the Director General at the time, Hugh Green, uh, or even downright dissidents, to use Hans Keller's words, these were warmly welcomed. The BBC seemed to want to be shaken up, and somebody like Keller, with his uncompromising standards and relentless questioning of everything the BBC was doing, seemed to be the man to do it. One almost felt, wrote Keller in later years, uh, look when he looked back on Green's tenure, one almost felt that he admired one in proportion as one disagreed with him, and one's sense of responsibility was, of course, strengthened by what I would describe as his imaginative trust in one's disloyalty. The winds changed in 1969, uh, which was the year Green left the BBC, and the year of the publication of Broadcasting in the 70s, the document in which the BBC outlined its plans for a restructuring of radio, including the abolition of the third programme and the streamlining of the networks into four channels programmed generically as pop, light, classical and talk. 
There was little mention of the arts in the document and nowhere did it betray any sense that radio might be important to the cultural life of the nation. Cultural broadcasting was now described simply as programs for minorities and the purpose of radio as a continuous supplier of music and information. The high cost of music programming was to be cut by disbanding some of the BBC's orchestras and by replacing live music by an increased use of gramophone records. For the first time, the BBC explicitly questioned its role as patron of music. The license income is supposed simply to finance broadcasting, the document stated. How far should it sustain a level of musical patronage beyond the immediate needs of broadcasting? This was greeted by uproar, not least amongst the BBC's own production staff who had not been consulted on the changes. The appointment of Charles Hill as Chairman of Governors in 1967 had heralded a new management style, and one sign of the changing times was that the small group responsible for broadcasting the 70s was, as the document itself stated, assisted by McKinsey and Co, rather than the BBC's own staff. Keller called this document a major exhibit in the evidence of the decline of the West, and his relationship with the BBC was never the same again. There isn't time to go into the story in detail now, but in short, what ruined Keller's relationship with the corporation's senior management was first that he was the major instigator of the public protest by the BBC's own producers, and second, and probably more significant, was that he refused ever to give up the argument. Long after his colleagues had either left the BBC or settled down into the new structure, Keller battled on and was a thorn in the side of his bosses for another 10 years. Ironically, the 1970s uh, were his own most prolific uh, years as a radio broadcaster, which was another source of friction as production staff was supposed to have strict limits on their appearance on air, so as not to be seen to be taking work away from outside speakers. But Keller was so good and his repertoire so wide that his fellow producers would not give up asking him onto their programmes, and even some of his irritated bosses admitted later that they listened to his talks and lectures absolutely spellbound. One of Keller's most famous broadcasts was the talk that he gave in the Radio 4 series The Time of My Life, in which famous speakers were asked to recall a particularly significant moment in their past. He received this invitation in 1973, at the same time as an invitation to speak at a pan-European conference celebrating 50 years of music on radio that was being organised by the IMZ International Centre for Music and Media in Vienna. For 30 years, Keller had avoided going back to Vienna after his traumatic escape at the age of 19. But he seems to have decided to make this trip a psychological as well as physical return and to write for his Radio 4 talk a full account of the nine months between his 19th birthday, which was the day the Nazis entered Austria, and his escape to London. His wife, Milan Cosman, went with him, and together they looked at the places where it had all happened, including the site of Keller's family home, destroyed when the Russians entered Vienna in 1945. They went to Leopoldstadt, to try to find the Jewish community centre where Keller had been arrested on the 9th of November, 1938. That was a weird feeling indeed, Keller wrote later, to walk around there, identify places, and realise at the same time that the vast majority of the former population has meanwhile died in the gas chambers. The building in which Keller had been imprisoned and lined up for execution was still there. And the Prince Eugen Palace, where he and other emigrating Jews were beaten up as they queued for their passport documents, was just around the corner from his and Milan's hotel. And they both contrasted her appreciation of the aesthetic beauty of the place and his vivid memory of what used to happen to him there. All the arguments at the BBC over the controlling of Keller's broadcasts, which ironically had by this point reached a climax, seemed to fade into irrelevance in the face of the 45 minute talk that Keller gave when he got back from that visit to Vienna. For his BBC colleagues and for most of his friends, this was the first time they had ever heard him speak about what had happened to him under the Nazis. They were stunned more than anything else by what the new controller of music, Robert Ponsonby called the astonishingly objective, balanced and humane way in which you reported such terrible events. 
Letters from listeners poured in, uh, more than 300, and to each of them, Keller wrote a deeply thought individual response. In general, though, he was depressed by the way that most of the letters he received seemed to display a kind of moral satisfaction at being able to feel horrified at the past. Most people seem desperate to get themselves out of the present, out of the need to do something here and now. Yet, said Keller, if there is any lesson to be drawn against any, drawn from any crime against humanity, it is that its sources inevitably are actively around us all the time and within us too. Otherwise, it could not possibly have happened." Unquote. He thanked his audience, but I must remind everybody that none of the 70,000 refugees in 1938 and 1939, most of whom had a similar story to tell, commanded a comparable audience or any audience to speak of when it would have mattered at the time. On the contrary, a British consulate official in Vienna treated us like dirt. World problem number one was not crimes against humanity, but Nazi expansion in the propaganda fight against which the crimes against humanity came in handy. Nobody would have declared war on the Germans because they killed off the Jews." Unquote. In an article written after the broadcast, he tried to bring his readers back to the here and now, to the only place where morality matters by showing them the everyday compromises, the compromises with conscience that we all so easily make. And this is my last quote from this article. Discretion, for instance, when used in the surface service of institutional aims um, of a party conference means lying. Confidentiality means keeping things secret from those below and from those outside the group in order to ensure power. Most strikingly, responsibility means the abandonment of responsibility. The more responsible your job, the more you are asked to silence your personal sense of responsibility and replace it by what the people on top of you think is good for you and everybody else. As a result, when we say that a man has grown into his senior job, we cover up for the fact that he's shrunk into it. A German general had little chance left to show humanity. A German soldier had, and some did. And if you'd like to hear um, that broadcast, Keller's Time of My Life broadcast, it's available on YouTube and I'll post the link in the chat. Thank you. Lovely, thank you so very much, Alison. Um, and now over to Dr. Ines Schlenker to talk about Milan Cosman, who's already been mentioned en passant. Uh, Ines is a uh, independent art historian based in London with a special interest, um, sorry, I have my camera on, uh, with a special interest in national socialist, so-called degenerate and emigre art and artists. Um, Hitler's Salon, her study of the officially approved art in the Third Reich, as shown at the Great German Art Exhibition, uh, was published in 2007. Subsequently, she's written a wonderful catalogue resume of the paintings of the wonderful <laughs> Vienna-born emigre artist, Marie-Louise von Matosicki, who was a close personal friend of Milain's. She also co-edited the artist's correspondence with the writer Elias Canetti, another remarkable individual, and curated the exhibition at Tate Britain, which some of you may have seen, which inaugurated the opening of the Marie-Louise von Matosicki Archive Gallery in 2019. 2020. Capturing Time is the most pertinent volume to mention here. Her study of the work and life of Milan Cosman came out in 2019, and her most recent book on Marc Chagall came out just earlier this year. Thank you very much, Ines, and over, over to you. Thank you very much, Monica. Let me just try and share my presentation. The first edition of Radio Times, the world's first listings magazine, appeared on the 28th of September, 1923. Designed to set out details of programs and comment on them, the magazine employed illustrations as an integral part of its strategy from the start. Drawing on established artists, as well as new talent to decorate its pages and covers, Radio Times quickly became a great nurturer of artistic talent. Soon the magazine evolved its own individual graphic idiom. Line drawings, which, alongside photographs, 
illustrated the imaginative world of radio for the listener, providing a pictorial summary of a program. The decade following the end of the Second World War has been labeled radio's golden age. The BBC steadily expanded its broadcasting so that by 1950, 71% of the population listened to the radio daily. Radio Times developed into one of the nation's best-selling magazines, reaching its highest weekly average of almost 9 million copies in 1955. Familiar, trusted, entertaining, and in everyone's home, Radio Times became part of the nation's cultural memory. As a famous national showcase for illustrations and the journal to which all illustrators aspired, Radio Times could take its pick from the best artists of the day. Working conditions, however, were far from ideal. Low pay and the challenge of producing drawings to tight deadlines and strict specifications made for onerous routines. All Radio Times illustrators were employed on a freelance basis and assigned work to which the magazine's art editor thought them best fitted and which matched their interests. Briefed on the general aim of an illustration and its correct dimensions, later to be scaled down to its required tiny size, the way each arrived at the desired outcome was left to the artist, resulting in a variety of recognizable styles and individual techniques across the magazine, as well as the decades. A small group of emigre draftsmen and women belonged to the elite Radio Times circle, among them Milan Kosman. Born in Gotha in 1921 to affluent, cultured, assimilated Jewish parents and brought up in Dusseldorf, Kosman completed her schooling in Switzerland. In summer 1939, she traveled on to London to begin her artistic training and enrolled at the Slade School of Fine Art, which was evacuated to Oxford during the war. After graduating in 1942, Cosman eked out an existence by working on a milk float, trying her hand at teaching and lecturing while attempting to start a freelance career as an illustrator. On moving to London in 1945, she showed her portfolio to countless magazine and book publishers. Although she received some commissions, her work often met with little interest and predictions of a dire future. Cosman's luck changed when she walked into the offices of Radio Times in November 1946. The magazine's art editor, Douglas Graham Williams, was impressed by what he saw and asked her to go to the BBC studios in Maida Vale and draw the composer and conductor, Constant Lambert. Cosman produced an animated portrait, which was published in Radio Times on the 16th of January, 1947. Despite the small scale and the somewhat stippled appearance of the reproduction, the artistic quality of the portrait convinced, convinced Williams to hire her as a freelance contributor with regular commissions. She became the magazine's specialist for musical subjects, developing a uniquely spontaneous style that captured the immediacy of music making. It would have been impossible to imagine a job that suited Cosman better. Working for Radio Times determined her career path and enabled her to discover her artistic identity. Later that year, she met her future husband, the Vienna-born writer and musicologist Hans Keller, whom we already heard about from Alison. And from now on, the spheres of art and music, as well as her private and professional life, were inextricably intertwined. In the wake of the Constant Lambert Commission, Cosman would go to as many rehearsals and concerts as possible, producing sketches on spec and building up a portfolio of sitters. Over the coming years, she was in the privileged position of coming face to face with the creme de la creme of the musical world and would almost always seize the chance to draw their portraits. These drawings constitute a graphic eyewitness account of London's post-war music scene, recording many major performances and assembling an unrivaled compendium of composers, conductors, singers, and instrumentalists. While at first the port first portraits of famous individuals dominated Cosman's contributions to Radio Times, over the next few years, her repertoire widened to include documenting musical festivals. Cosman was regularly called upon to illustrate the proms organized by the BBC over a period of several weeks in the summer at the Royal Albert Hall in London. In 
The prompt drawings from the second half of the 1950s in particular encapsulate her creativity and skill for finding original variations and fresh ways of presenting an essentially unchanging theme by capturing scenes from unusual angles and focusing on interesting details. Her sketches made at rehearsals and concerts leave no aspect of the proms untouched. They range from grand exterior views of the circular building to close up depictions of individuals, groups of musicians and overviews of the entire crowded stage. The audience often features either depicted en masse or represented by a small number of individuals with the plush surroundings of the Royal Albert Hall, allowing for unusual perspectives, spectacular views, and the highlighting of architectural details. In her search for interesting subject matter, Cosman explored every corner of the concert hall and all possible viewpoints. From the gallery at the top of the building to the steps leading up to the arena in its bowels, where tired promise can rest. Occasionally, she applies a personal touch, for example, when she includes Hans Keller in the audience, intently following the music, a score in his lap. In order to open up novel perspectives on a familiar subject, she homes in on scenes that are characterized by repetition and order, such as a line of double basses or a row of singers, in the process creating almost abstract patterns. Her most ambitious drawings show a combination of conductor, musicians and audience totally engrossed in the fact of making and listening to music. On a more practical level, Cosman must have been an ideal contributor to Radio Times. Her resistance to using a pen was soon overcome and the disciplining effects of deadlines, though annoying at times, helped her focus and create an immense body of work. With three, 233 original drawings held at the BBC Written Archives Centre, she was among the most prolific artists working for Radio Times. Due to their often generic nature, the drawings could be shown almost at random in weekly listings or accompany special features and were used repeatedly over the years. Cosman's habit of producing drawings on spec also meant that often the required image had already been completed before the art editor asked for it. Besides, her inventive drawings were perfectly pitched to the Radio Times readers, who could identify with their truthful reproductions of the events and atmosphere in the concert hall. One reader pointed out a recent sketch that had particularly caught her attention. Note this Friday, July the 7th, 27th sketch, the broad back of the soloist and one can feel the very music being interpreted. Cosman's association with Radio Times lasted for over two decades and provided her with a small but steady income that for many years was her main resource. In 1950, Douglas Graham Williams was succeeded by Ralph Dean Usherwood. His time as art editor was probably the most fruitful artistic period of the magazine and coincided with Cosman's most productive time there. Usherwood particularly appreciated Cosman's habit of drawing from life. This, he opined, imbued her illustrations with great res re a real respect for the music itself and, in the case of portraits, allowed her to give the impression of a face in motion. Usherwood's replacement in 1960, C.J. Campbell Mann, lacked his predecessor's interest in Cosman's art and only occasionally turned to her for illustrations so that her work at Radio Times, which by now increasingly relied on photography anyway, slowly fizzled out. A portrait of the pianist Victoria Postnikova in December 1967, probably not unlike this one, was among her last assignments. Usherwood's retirement also coincided with the beginning of Hans Keller's career as a senior member of staff in the music division at the BBC. Cosman was thus relieved of the burden of being the principal breadwinner, which she had carried for many years. She developed a fruitful working relationship with her husband, which, for example, led to the publication of Musical Sketchbook in 1957. The book brought together 60 of her portraits 
of composers, conductors, instrumentalists and singers, many of which had first been seen in the pages of Radio Times. Thank you very much. Lovely, thank you very much Ines. Good, so what a rich, uh, a rich palette we've been offered. Um, now it's just gone nine, but I'm sure I hope that most of you will wish to carry on the conversation as it were. Uh, now, of course, is your chance to ask any questions or indeed proffer any comments you may have on what has been uh, said so far. So, um, Emma, I don't know if you'd like to just sort of check if there are any questions coming in or hands being raised. You can either ask the question for yourself or um, uh, type it into the chat again. I'm sure you all know the ropes. Um, I'm just wondering, actually, while you're pondering what you might want to contribute, those of you in the audience, whether we might ask Judy Herman, who is, like myself, closely associated with Jewish Renaissance, mainly in relation to drama, to just very briefly, Judy, if you would, tell us about your own first-hand encounter with the wonderful Milan. I think it was in 2008, am I right? And indeed the sketch that she uh, yes, decided to produce with you. Please go, go ahead, Judy. I hope you can hear me. Uh, we can indeed. Yes, we can. Yeah. The most important thing is to be able to see me. And I'll show you why in a minute, because I'm going to obliterate myself. The top of your I head is to... chopped off at the moment, but uh, right. mm -hmm. the top of your head is slightly chopped. Right. Sorry about that, but you'll see in a minute why you're not going to see much of me. I went to interview her for Woman's Hour in um, because she was, I think she was going to be, yeah, she was doing a series of, of whatever it was. And um, she, a, she was amazing, the way she welcomed me into her home. She was so animated and so warm and so bright. But B, did you get any impression during the time that we've heard about her, how quickly she worked? Mm -hmm. Imagine that I was probably only there for an hour. And I didn't even realise, I don't think, what she was actually doing. She was sketching away. Me, she was sketching me. And at the end of the time, she gave me this sketch which I'm going to show you now, I hope. Does I obliterate myself? Can you see that? Absolutely. Yeah. What do you think of that? That was done in the time I was there with me barely knowing she was doing it. So you, you just need to know how quickly she worked and how cleverly and how very um, sparingly, because I don't know if you can see, but it's actually on a piece of paper with perforations down the side and there's something else on the back of it. So, I mean, I'm just... You can put on the back of a bit of paper that wondering whether it's not worth more what's on the other side probably for all I know but anyway there was already a sketch on the other side so she was obviously um uh, looking after the paper shortages and things like that she would have loved it today anyway I'll never forget her she was absolutely amazing and wonderful and I was feel so privileged to come home with that sketch which I didn't even know she was making so I just wanted to, oh, and if you did look it up online, um, there are several, we, we managed to include a little gallery of several sketches in the, um, in the blurb that I wrote for the, um, for, for the programme, for my, for my little segment of the programme, one of which is Benjamin Britten's parrot. Mm -hmm. So, And do you rest uh, assured? Judy, we've actually just posted, Emma has kindly posted the link to that portfolio of sketches, including the panel, you, <laughs> online. <laughs> also, incidentally, a link to the very, very useful and informative uh, Cosman Keller um, Arts Trust website, which is an absolute mine of information yes. for, both, yes. for both figures. Judy, thanks ever so much. Now, Emma, do we have any other questions or comments coming through at all? Not yet. Not yet. Okay, perhaps I can just set the ball rolling and I guess we shouldn't go on for too much longer. But um, Stephen, I've got a number of questions, particularly for you, um, which might just, just get things moving. Um, it's a question of insiders and outsiders, to what extent you identify as one or the other or both simultaneously. Um, Alison, you made it completely clear that Keller was never afraid, indeed, almost intent, perhaps slightly perversely or bravely, you know, on, on, on asserting himself as an outsider, even in a position of you know, considerable authority. But what was Nicholas Pefner's view on, on that issue? I mean, he obviously wasn't a true-blooded Briton, or presumably would he have wanted to be. There he is writing, you know, having the effrontery, in a sense, to, to, to proclaim, you know, on, on the Englishness of English art, um, with these German nationalist sort of sentiments at the outset in which he comes to this country. How did he see himself, you know, as he sort of became more integral, if you like, to the, the, the you know, the contribution of the BBC? How did he perceive himself in relation to issues of Britishness? 
Well, it depends when we're talking about. Mm. Um, he comes here for the first time in November 1933, and he comes here a couple of years ahead of his wife and family. He then he brings he brings Lola over in 1935. Mm. I can't think of any other, I don't know what's the word, refugee, expatriate, who goes back to Germany every year for his holidays. Mm. It's absolutely bizarre. Um, I mean, both of their parents, of course, are still in, in, uh, in, in Germany. Um, and they go back and they stay uh, with, uh, with Lola's parents in particular, because the, the father has a vineyard at Wittenkram near Namburg. And they're very happy to go back. I mean, I would have thought that if I had got out of Germany, I'd want to jolly well stay out and start laying down roots in my country of arrival, as I'm sure most other people did. No doubt um, his uh, father-in-law paid for him to go back, so it wasn't such a, a drain on him. At a later stage in his life, it's remarkable how he was embraced by English people, I think not least because of the BBC. I mean, he was the great promoter of art talk um, on, on the radio, more than anybody else. Um, uh, um, uh, Gombrich couldn't, Gombrich had the most terrible Austrian, and you couldn't understand a word he said. Um, what was remarkable about Pevsner is he had his thin little Saxon accent, and he, pra he honed it, and it was really very, 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 very pure. Um, he, um, he, he was embraced by the English as the person who taught the English how to be English. He was often sort of complimented as being more English than the English, you know, more Catholic than the Pope. Um, and I think he liked that. Whether he ever actually fully embraced it in his heart, I don't know. Because every year, I mean, where his idea of a good holiday was a one week walking tour uh, in the Black Forest. I mean, you know, they, they, those were where he, they, those are where his roots are. So I, I think, I think, although the English, and, and I, um, was it uh, Elizabeth said, uh, Alison, I mean, um, uh, talked about the, the uh, Hans Keller's, um, how, how sort of disgusted he was at the way that the, the English praised themselves for being horrified, you know, like that. Um, I, I think that there were people who just enjoyed the sense that they were big enough to welcome him. But I mean, it could have gone the other way. And there was no shortage of people who deplored him and loathed him and who were deeply anti-Semitic and didn't want him around, uh, both because he was Jewish and because he was a foreigner. And the perfect example is John Betjeman, who regarded him, him as his great enemy, his great um, uh, nemesis because he just knew everything more and had higher qualifications, had better qualifications. He didn't want to be told how to be English, English uh, by, a, by a German. Thank you. Um, also, just more, more specifically, you mentioned Anna Kalin, who herself is an interesting character, and you didn't have time or didn't choose to mention Leonie Kuhn. And I wondered if you could just tell her very briefly about her, because she's another, perhaps much less, or indeed much less well-known Jewish emigre figure in this wider story of the BBC. Yes. Well, Leonie um, had been a refugee herself. Um, and... Um, I think when she arrived in this country, she boarded with Herbert Reed. Is that right? I believe in, so. in um, where Amersham or somewhere or wherever Reed lived somewhere in. Well, in, Hamps in Hampstead, I think it was. I, I may be wrong. I think he had a home out in somewhere or other. Anyway, she was there, and she absolutely adored the BBC, and eventually got a, a job there. Leonie, from what I remember of her, um, was just enraptured in awe of the BBC. And Pevsner never thought very much of her because he, I mean, there were other people that he had arguments with. I mean, Basil Taylor had big arguments with. Um, in the case of Leonie, I think she let him pretty well do what he liked. And he didn't have a lot of admiration for her intellectually. I think she was too much in awe of him really to say at any point, uh, Nikolaus, uh, you, what you've said really doesn't quite make sense or isn't a well-constructed argument. 
Um, and so, although she did more programs with him than, than anything else, I think she, I think he was rather dismissive. I mean, if I'm saying what 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 he thought of her, I think he was dismissive of her. She ended up, by the way, um, uh, when she retired from the BBC, um, working with a woman called Monica Pigeon. I don't really know Monica. Monica had been the editor of the uh, she'd been the editor of Architectural Design. Uh, in the 1970s, uh, when it was at its most um, uh, free lovish and freakish and 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 uh, LSD ish, um, and impossible to read, impossible to read yellow print on yellow pages. Um, and then she became the editor of the RIBA Journal. And then when she retired from that, she and Leonie invented. Uh, they they set up a, a thing where they would go around interviewing architects and then selling cassettes and sets of 24 slides and little packages. Uh, I think it was called Pigeon Post. Um, and uh, yeah. No, I, I didn't know about that, thank you. Um, Daniel Snowman, was that a hand I saw, a virtual hand or a, <laughs> an on-screen hand? Would you like to chip in? You're, you're muted, Daniel. Daniel, you need to unmute yourself if you want yeah. to. Yeah, try to be modest about that. I've already had my go a month ago. Uh, no, uh, a word or two about uh, most of the people we just heard about. I mean, Leonie Cohn was a colleague of mine when I was at the BBC. And you're, you're, you're quite right about the Herbert Reed and Hampstead connection and so on. And we all loved her. And she was um, the only person really to be able to produce programs on radio about art and artists, an amazing achievement when you think of it. Hans Keller, of course, was one of the major figures there uh, when I was there. Um, he could be very, very tough on his superiors, but he was terribly sweet to his inferiors like myself. <laughs> I remember doing a program about Rosemary Brown, the musical medium who was hearing things live and taking dictation from Liszt and Brahms and so on. And I was going to do a program with her all about what she did, how, was she a fraud? Was she a genius and didn't recognize? So I phoned Hans Keller. I said, Hans, I'm gonna see this Rosemary Brown. You know, if you've got any ideas of things I should ask her. And Hans, he said, I'll tell you what, Daniel, ask her if she can ask Mozart where he's buried. <laughs> because he's in this St. Mark's grave in Vienna when nobody quite knew, knew where. <laughs> you know, it was all said that he was not buried in the proper place, but the Emperor Joseph II was buried everybody outside the walls. For, you know. And indeed, I asked her as spontaneously I, as I could if she could uh, have a word with um, Mr. Mozart. By the way, what was his English like? What was his accent like? <laughs> And unfortunately, Wolfgang didn't come through to her that day, so we never quite knew. But that was very Hans. He was, he was tough on his superiors. There'd be big meetings at the BBC with everybody present from the controllers down. And Hans, to whom English was a second language, would get up with no notes and say, well, I've been very interested to hear all I have heard, but I have five points that I would like to submit if I may. Firstly, and I thought, shit, how's he gonna remember all five of them? But he always did. And his English was so much better than mine would ever be. And he was that sort of amazing character. And I remember him visiting when he was very ill. He and Milan were still living just, just off um, um, Church Row in Hampstead. And he would chat very easily and relaxedly. Milan, of course, lived very much longer, right through till her nineties and died not so very long ago. And um, one final point, first time I ever met Meline, back in, I guess, the eighties, soon after Hans had died, was at the home of Zygmunt Nissel, member of the Amadeus Quartet. And Ziggy and his wife invited Meline round and I was there, all very nice. Got to know Meline quite well over many, many years. And uh, there was mention earlier of Benjamin Britten, Britain's final third quartet was dedicated to Hans, and the first performance of it was from our friends, the Amadeus Quartet. So everything links up. And one other thing I never knew um, <coughs> um, uh, Nikolaus personally, <laughs> I remember meeting his, his son, the publisher, but of course, not that long after 
Pevsner did the wreath lectures, uh, there was an invitation to another German refugee art historian, Edgar Wint, who talked also on air for the wreath lectures for the BBC back in those days about why art is often presented under dangerous and scary circumstances. And that all led on, we mentioned Gombrich to the, the institute that he headed and so on. Amazing bunch of people. And I was very privileged to know some of them fairly up close, but well done all three of you. I learned a lot and loved the evening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel. That's a lovely way to end uh, what's been a wonderful <laughs> evening indeed. And looking at the clock, I think, although we could carry on, I will resist the temptation to do so and hand over to my colleague, um, Sybil Sheridan, just to say a few last concluding words. Well, Steve and Alison Inez, I want to thank you so much for bringing to life for us three very different but fascinating characters and through them to bring out a particular period in the history of the BBC, which I think is so rarely spoken of these days. Uh, you've really brought it to life. And I have to say, it's with a little bit of regret to think that those days are no longer with us, which I think is something probably, certainly uh, uh, an attitude that Hans Keller um, shared. Um, I don't know about, about the others, but thank you all three of you really for a wonderful evening. Next week, we are moving into a very different area. We have the last two been looking very much at the arts. We're now going to tackle religion and religious broadcasting. Um, and it possibly seems a little bit strange to talk about the Jewish contribution to religious broadcasting, bearing in mind how the very strongly Christian ethos with which the BBC was originally founded. But there has certainly or much more recently, I mean, we all know about the contributions of Lionel, Rabbis Lionel Bew and Hugo Grin to the, the BBC, um, uh, but and, and um, much more recently to a number of other members of um, uh, rabbis and others, who, and of course, who are contributing now to a much broader pluralistic view of religious broadcasting. So we have with us next week, um, Alex Rangways Booth, who is an editor of religious programming uh, for BBC Local Radio and has also been very much engaged um, in other areas of the BBC. Rabbi Jonathan Wittenberg, who contributes to Thought for the Day and Prayer for the Day on Radio 4. And Rabbi Pete Tobias, who um, for many, many years was a contributor to Pause for Thought on Radio 2. Um, and we will have them in discussion and uh, looking at where religious broadcasting going, is going. Is there any reason for it to continue? What's its point? What's it for? So please do join us at eight o'clock next Monday to look at uh, religion and the BBC. Lovely. Um... Just perhaps um, as an extra little coda to all this, uh, to mention that on the Insiders Outsiders YouTube channel, which you can find easily enough by just Googling it, um, or indeed via the main Insiders Outsiders Festival uh, Dot org website, you can hear recordings, for example, of our friend Ines here giving a wonderful, much more extended talk on me line and greater range, the sort of uh, extent of her of um, also a number of, or in fact, quite a few, um, events on the matter of internment, which we actually haven't had time to touch on. I would have loved to ask you both Alison uh, and Stephen, you know, how the, the two protagonists, you know, reacted to that experience, however short it was. But anyway, um, and Alison, I believe, in fact, you took part in one, didn't you, on, on music in internment. Um, also, I'd like to just end finally, and I promise to shut up in a, in a second, that actually in my head, very much at an embryonic stage at the moment, but I have actually secured the interest of the current artistic director at Dartington Hall to to do an event hopefully for October next year looking at what is still an understudied subject, the hugely rich contribution of guess what, the refugees from Nazi Europe to the early years of Dartington and Alison uh, you are currently working on the history of the summer school which is going to feed into that project all, all being well. So I'll bid you good night, thank you everyone once again, thank you for being here everyone and we hope to see you again soon. Good night.